Great. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. And uh, uh, of course, I'd encourage you to uh, visit the uh, Park AFM website to find out more particulars about our uh, uh, different projects and also the uh, current list of webinars and past webinars. So today I'm going to talk about 3D printing, uh, photocurable cellulose nanocrystals, and our work with uh, PEGDA, which is polyethylene glycol diacrylate monomers to form uh, strong nanocomposites using um, nano reinforcements from CNC crystals. So I'm with Case Western Reserve University, Department of Macromolecular Science Engineering. Uh, I've been a professor there, uh, full professor since 2012. And uh, we have a vibrant group of researchers focusing on polymers and nanomaterials, and uh, more recently on 3D printing. Uh, I'd also like to take the time to introduce Thinkbox. Uh, this is uh, an institute for collaboration in innovation in additive manufacturing. We have uh, plenty of space. It is also a maker space, which is a term for a lot of these open user facilities. Uh, that is used for both rapid prototyping and education in uh, additive manufacturing. So if you're ever at CASE, this is a good place to uh, have a tour. Uh, in this institute, uh, we have several major uh, uh, 3D printing instrumentation, including the big uh, systems from uh, Stratasys 3D systems, uh, actually, uh, Ultimaker, uh, we have several Ultimakers and Maker Gear equipment, but also it has a lot of subtractive manufacturing, laser uh, etching, cutting capabilities. So again, these are things you'll see uh, at the think box. Now, uh, my academic phase uh, is that we produce a lot of nanostructured materials at interfaces. So we are very familiar with working on nanomaterials that include graphene, carbon nanotube, silica nanoparticles, nanoclay. Uh, we specialized in uh, grafting polymers at interfaces, uh, looking at surface sensitive uh, spectroscopic and microscopic methods uh, to modify interfaces. So this is just but a picture uh, I would say uh, an academic phase uh, that we have, uh, and it certainly it's how my PhD students uh, graduate. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, a number of collaborations with industries, uh, from coatings to plastics uh, manufacturing to different types of uh, barrier coatings, EMI shielding applications, non biophilic surfaces, and so on. Uh, of course, I will not be at liberty to talk uh, with such uh, projects we have, but just letting you know that uh, we are attuned, attuned to working with different challenges uh, in 3D printing as it relates even to commercialization. So in a way, we bridge the gap between uh, the best of the basic platform that comes from university and the market needs. Uh, after all, it's all about cost performance ratioing or trying to find a solution to a problem that somebody wants and are willing to pay for. Let's talk about 3D printing. Uh, back in 2016, I had the privilege of uh, going to the World Economic Forum in Dubai. Uh, I'm a, a member of the uh, Futures for Advanced Materials Council with the World Economic Forum. Uh, I gave a talk back then on the future perspective of uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And as you can see in this collage, uh, a lot of the promise uh, goes towards uh, not only rapid prototyping, but high performance, more complex type of structures that cannot be made uh, at, uh, even today, but in the future uh, should be of uh, importance. And that goes from biomedical, uh, bioprinting, tissue engineering, all the way to manufacturing in space. Uh, a lot of the things that we can uh, enjoy, of course, is not only this aesthetic uh, beauty, but also the functionality that comes with 3D printing. And uh, our, one of our important goals is to find materials that can be 3D printed and have 
function uh, not only for prototyping but for actual parts replacement. Here you can see uh, the beauty of what we can do with mimicking nature or getting the best design. You can out of uh, uh, natural systems, uh, bio inspiration, and as you can see, you can create something new and even introduce these design concepts uh, to improve uh, thermomechanical performance or biomechanics, or even uh, it's uh, used in scaffolding all the way to tissue growth. One of the big growth areas of uh, 3D printing is, of course, in biomedical applications from uh, prosthesis devices to different types of uh, bone replacement, uh, dentistry, uh, etc. And as you can see, one can take advantage of the advances in imaging and resolution to uh, allow uh, the fabrication of, let's say, prosthesis devices with exacting uh, lightness. Uh, the promise of using 3D printing or bioprinting to recreate organs or to enable the spatial temporal differentiation of cells. A lot of work has been done on hydrogels. Uh, uh, enables one to see the future of uh, uh, manufacturing tissues and organs or even sensors or implantable devices. A key uh, type of 3D printing and uh, uh, because of uh, lack of time I will not review uh, uh, 3D printing methods uh, very common and very much available which includes FDM uh, fuse deposition modeling, SLS, uh, um, scanning laser sintering, uh, uh, and instead focus on one that involves lithography. Now, uh, many years ago, I was introduced actually to 3D printing, but that was based on two photon lithography. Two photon lithography is quite efficient, but more importantly, uh, it is used to fabricate very small or high res uh, devices or high resolution uh, patterns or uh, uh, high reproducibility as well. And this involves two photon uh, type of mechanisms. However, uh, today when you hear the word SLA or DLP, this involves one photon uh, polymerization. So polymerization photopolymerization basically involves the use of uh, um, light uh, to be laser light or simply uh, um, attenuated light uh, even a focus light coming from a micro lens or a digital micro display uh, where the initiation of the polymerization takes place uh, the light basically initiates uh, uh, initiators, which then, of course, uh, results in propagation slash cross-linking. And then uh, for the uh, firm buildup, sometimes one has to leave the object for uh, a while in order to get maximum degree of cross-linking. Essentially, it's a photopolymerization mechanism, and what we call addition chain addition reaction uh, in uh, uh, polymerization technology. Uh, and where we use uh, dye cross uh, dye monomers or dye functional monomers uh, will involve cross linking or even semi or interpenetrated networks based on the presence of other polymers or compositions. I will explain that in a little while, except to point here and emphasize that SLA and high resolution uh, is the key towards. Uh, uh, some very good looking parts, very strong parts. And in our case today, for this uh, uh, webinar, we will focus on reinforcement uh, using cellulose nanocrystals as a nano filler. So here you can see, of course, in this uh, uh, collage again, some of the fine high resolution uh, 3D printed parts uh, using SLA. And here, uh, just to differentiate an SLA versus DLP, uh, usually an SLA uh, involves that of moving uh, um, 
platform as well as a mechanical device that sweeps fresh uh, monomer, uh, dimer, crosslinker composition. And light can come from the top or the bottom. And uh, one can, for example, use UV initiation to allow uh, polymerization. On the other hand, digit, uh, uh, digital light uh, processing or DLP is, is basically projection. Projection, let's say, from an LCD projector. Uh, the VAT contains the resin material, uh, which I'll classify later as being made up of your initiator, uh, diluent monomer, cross linker, and so on. And as the uh, digital light is projected, polymerization takes place uh, on the surface of the platform, and the platform is slowly but finely uh, elevated as the um, um, material cures, polymerization takes place or cross-linking takes place. And then finally, you have an object. And, and both types of printing uh, usually takes hours uh, uh, to complete, simply because uh, the cross-linking needs to build up strength and separate from the uh, monomer resin composition. Uh, now, sometimes you hear the word clip process or even the company called carbon. Uh, this is a, basically a high years, higher speed uh, type of SLA or DLP in that uh, the, the, the biggest difference with DLP is that the oxygen permeability is controlled basically by a membrane uh, which allows quenching of the radicals uh, continuously. In other words, unlike uh, uh, SLA or other projection mechanism, this one doesn't involve, involve a, a mechanical arm that uh, moves or replenishes the resin, but rather the material uh, um, is built up uh, whilst uh, the diffusion of the uh, resin takes place continuously. Uh, it is a much faster process than a common SLA, let's say, that uh, uses a form labs uh, system such as what we have, uh, and it's patented as well. So the clip process is basically a modification of these uh, photopolymerization methods I've been describing. So the result is you get uh, high resolution parts as shown here, as compared to other types of uh, uh, polymerization or uh, 3D printing methods involving extrusion. In that, you get very high uh, resolution and uh, cross-linking or strength. But uh, this strength is basically based on acrylate chemistry or other types of telekelic uh, and oligomers uh, involving acrylate groups. So that is really just the limitation of uh, this method. So you cannot 3D print high-performance polymers like PEAK or uh, PEI, or uh, some of those geared towards metal replacement, okay? So uh, here is another picture of the SLA process. The uh, one uh, we use a lot is the uh, form labs, uh, and also we have a photocentric DLP. Uh, essentially, the uh, polymerization takes place uh, in the uh, liquid resin area, and as you can see, as the cured resin uh, uh, is finished, the platform raises and elevated in step with the uh, rate of the polymerization uh, that takes place. And of course, the light source of initiation comes here uh, at the bottom as shown in the diagram. So here's an actual movie of uh, a, a 3D printing that we're doing. Uh, and this one involves the uh, uh, form labs uh, material. And as you can see here, the uh, object is printed, reinserted, printed, reinserted, and so on. And the moving arm uh, is used for uh, replenishing uh, uh, monomer and uh, uh, cross linker species so that you can grow the object more uniformly. And, and I like the clip process or the carbon process. This uh, uh, SLA involves a lot of moving mechanical parts. So let's talk about uh, reinforcement, nanocomposites and nanomaterials. So uh, commercially available nanomaterials can start with carbon nanotubes, graphene, nanoclay, 
for a long time, metal, metal oxides has been around, silica, titanium nanoparticles, POS, which is polyhedral oligomeric Sielsewski oxane, uh, is very much available and used in a number of applications. Uh, nanofibers and of course cellulose nanocrystals and nanofibers. Um, so we have a wide range, as you can see here, of commercially available nanofiller materials that have long been used to reinforce properties of uh, um, extruded, uh, thermoformed, uh, uh, film blown type of polymers, uh, but have yet to find major uses uh, in a lot of 3D printed materials. So a lot of 3D printed materials, of course, uses filler uh, borrowed from nanocomposite uh, uh, type of uh, compositions, uh, but in order to classify the use of a nanofiller correctly for 3D printing, they have to have a reinforcement or improvement of property, which can be as little as 0.1% uh, due to the fact that with nanomaterials, you can emphasize on nanostructuring. Uh, or in order to justify the more uh, these more expensive uh, nanofiller materials versus that of traditional filler materials, you have to use less of this in order to um, make the uh, performance cost ratio proposition. So I'll just review a couple of these uh, uh, nanofiller materials we get before we go on into uh, nanocellulose itself. So carbon nanotubes uh, can be classified as single walled or multi walled. Uh, these days you can obtain both, but uh, more inexpensively, uh, you can get, get multi walled carbon nanotubes, and they've been used uh, in a host of uh, electrical and thermal reinforcement. Uh, in this case, as you can see from the graph, the addition of anywhere from 0.1 to uh, 2. Uh, percent of the nanotube on PMMA results in an increase in the storage modulus, uh, which can be measured uh, rheologically or by DMA methods, uh, revealing that the higher amount of carbon nanotubes results in uh, thermomechanical reinforcement. And usually this involves a minimum percolation threshold by which you will see uh, a big jump in um, properties compared to materials without uh, the filler. A favorite material of us these days involves working with graphene, graphene oxide. Graphene oxide can be derived from oxidation methods on graphite chips. The exfoliation, delamination can be done uh, in a high shear or mixing environment, but essentially a oxidizing agent like KMNO4 does the job very well. The only thing is you have to remove uh, that oxidizing agent for whatever purposes you have that uh, you don't want to have any further oxidation. And that means cleanup. So the preparation of this graphene oxide, sometimes we call the Hammers method, is very well known. And there are also other dispersions of graphene oxide. The main thing is, as you can see from this graph, the tensile strength, again, is improved by the addition of uh, the nanofiller, graphene nanofiller. And this strength building can go from high strength to more uh, thermoplastic and uh, even elastomeric uh, properties. And uh, here you can see graphene oxide uh, being used this way, but it also has excellent the electrical and thermal conductivity, even antimicrobial properties. Uh, third, you can see here that nanoclay has been used for reinforcement of polymers, essentially by uh, dispersing them, networking, and also forming barrier layers uh, that has been uh, used and is in fact commercially used in a number of automotive applications, including work with nylon, uh, other polyolefins, and in our case, we have actually used nanoclay uh, to improve properties of uh, other types of uh, uh, thermoplastics, uh, even high performance uh, thermoplastics. So uh, let's look at nanocellulose, okay? Much has been written from nanocellulose. Uh, I will not review those sources in detail. Essentially, cellulosic material is all over the planet. Uh, cellulose is derived from plants, 
and therefore to get nanocellulose which, which can be the fiber form or the nanocrystal form involves breaking down cellulose and essentially digesting taking pulp uh, using uh, either alkali or acid treatment in order to arrive at a fibril microfibril and then finally a nanocellulose. Essentially, it's the breakdown of the crystalline form of the cellulose. And various plants have different yields uh, and also a strength, quote unquote, based on the alpha crystallinity of the cellulose. So in fact, we can get cellulose from uh, wood pulp, from paper pulp, and in this case, from abaca pulp. Now, uh, in our experience working with abaca, and we've actually used it for a number of uh, uh, cellulose dissolution methods is that abaca uh, is quite high strength uh, and actually enables us to get both nanocrystals and nanofiber based on the treatment method. Now, abaca is a very important plant. Uh, um, uh, about a uh, hundred years ago, this was actually a big export uh, of the Philippines uh, and they use it for making rope or cordage and uh, it's also used for other things involving upholstery. And in fact, the biggest use of abaca right now is paper, paper currency, because of their high uh, appeal in strength and processability. So what we did is we essentially prepared nano crystals out of abaca. We then incorporated several amounts of this uh, on a PEGDA, and I'll show you what the structure of PEGDA. It's polyethylene glycol diacrylate, uh, one of our favorite uh, uh, cross-linkers in uh, SLA processes, and essentially prepared a formulation that also contained uh, the initiator and bilionate monomer. Finally, we used that resin instead of the commercial resin from Form Labs, and with the STL um, sliced design, uh, we can then um, produce this part uh, and then test it for its thermomechanical properties. So here's a resin composition, a typical resin composition in our experiments. Uh, PEGDA is shown in that structure. Essentially, we can get various molecular weights of the uh, uh, polyethylene glycol, uh, but at the end group, we have diacrylates, which is important for cross-linking. And then we have TEMPO, which is a uh, stable radical, uh, which can be used to control the activity of the initiator. The initiator structure is shown with uh, the designation LAP, and then uh, RO16 is basically a dye that controls the uh, absorption of light. So these main ingredients, together actually with other acrylate monomers, which I call the uh, uh, diluent monomers, allow us to vary the strength, the curing time, and uh, even the viscosity of the resin that we use for SLA. And the final magic ingredient is cellulose or nanocellulose uh, with a structure that is shown below. Um, so how do the nanocellulose look like? Well, uh, here we have uh, transmission electron microscopy and atomic force microscopy of the nanocellulose. The, the solution itself uh, can be cloudy uh, of high concentration, but from the TEM and AFM data, you can clearly see the nanocrystals uh, having an aspect ratio of one is to 200 uh, or, um, as you can see here, it's fairly uh, elongated, but not very long as in the case of fibers. And we can use AFM to measure the average uh, dimension or histogram from the TEM. So the, these are two nanocrystals, again, from the breakdown of the uh, crystalline form of uh, cellulose. So after incorporating this uh, with the resin, we then tested and confirm the presence of the uh, nanocellulose by IR or infrared spectroscopy. And as you can see here, uh, the pure CNC does not have the um, peaks associated with the PEGDA. However, upon adding the CNC, you can clearly see a correlation uh, with the uh, 
presence of CNC, uh, mainly in the 3500 region, which allows for a lot of the hydroxyl groups present on CNC. Uh, but also mass uh, is the region around uh, 2000. But overall, as you can see, you can uh, um, monitor or norma normalize the increase in uh, the peaks associated with CNC as you increase the concentration. And this is shown uh, dramatically in B, um, blood B, which shows the differences between uh, the uh, CNC, pure CNC, and various concentration. Uh, in fact, the crosslink and the non-crosslink PEGDA CNC have distinct differences as well. Now, having confirmed the presence of the nanocellulose on the 3D printed uh, materials, we then went to evaluate the tensile strength, the elongation, the modulus, as well as the fracture energy. So just by looking at these plots, you can see the differences between zero loading on a couple of properties. More dramatically with the elongation and the fracture energy as well as the tensile strength. The tensile modulus that does not seem, seem to show a big improvement. Uh, another thing is you can say that the uh, percolation threshold probably starts at 0.3 or even less weight percent. Now that is good news because most filler materials definitely you only observe strength uh, even at higher concentrations from 5 to 10 percent. So that means as little as 0.3 percent, we double the tensile strength. And you can clearly see the uh, changes as well on the elongation and the fracture energy. Now, a good measurement is the area under the curve for a stress strain experiment. And as you can see here, compared to 0 weight percent, uh, adding uh, 0.3 weight percent CNC uh, increases the tensile strength dramatically with that large increase in area under the curve. And this is consistent with some of the um, conventional methods and uh, uh, literature values we have observed. Now, one interesting thing here is the addition of 1.2 weight percent actually shows a less dramatic improvement. Uh, we don't have evidence yet, uh, but this has to do with the um, uh, lack of uh, reinforcing nanostructures uh, with increasing 1.2 weight percent. So in other words, it is possible that adding too much CNC does not help uh, uh, simply because they start aggregating. In other words, at 0.3 weight percent, we, we hit a, a very important uh, uh, nanostructuring slash composition ratio that dramatically improves the property of the SLA 3D printed part. Now here are thermal analysis uh, uh, experiments. Uh, uh, the one on the upper right in, involves TGA or thermogravimetric uh, analysis. And if you get the derivative of that slope, you can clearly see the changes in degradation as you go from different compositions of the PEGDA and uh, CNC. And uh, one simply notes here that addition of the CNC uh, versus pure PEGDA uh, results in changes in degradation or weight loss uh, in principle between 200 to 400 degrees C. Now some of the charring can perhaps be associated with uh, what is observed between 400 to uh, 600 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, now a more important experiment for us is monitoring by DSC the heat flow uh, between different compositions uh, because the heat flow allows us to measure the crystallization temperature and the melting temperature. Uh, what is important, let's say, in the lower graph is that the uh, enhancement of the crystallization temperature uh, ongoing with uh, increase in amount of CNC uh, as well as the melting temperature. So what this means is the addition of nanocellulose definitely increases the melting point of the material. And then uh, a method called dynamic mechanical analysis 
allows us to calculate the storage modulus, which is uh, about modulus or the elastic strength, um, uh, and the tan delta, which is a ratio of the bulk and the uh, storage uh, um, or storage or loss modulus. So again, this picture shows us that the in general uh, addition of nanocellulose increases the storage modulus um, and also uh, uh, changes the glass transition temperature, essentially um, lowers uh, the glass transition temperature. And that might have long-term implication in terms of future uses of this material or exposure to uh, temperature. Uh, and then at this graph, and uh, we're almost done, uh, looking at the wetting behavior of the PEGDA. PEGDA is a classified as a hydrogel uh, as well, uh, not only um, in terms of the degree of cross-linking, but the PEGDA can be water swellable. So what this picture shows to us is that the wetting of pure PEGDA uh, gives it a hydrophilic nature. However, the addition of more nanocellulose can result in uh, changes in that wetting behavior uh, more dramatically at uh, uh, 0.9 weight percent. Uh, the swelling does change. Uh, the addition of the nanocellulose degree, uh, decreases the amount of swelling, so possibly increasing the amount of uh, cross-linking or even uh, semi-interpenetrated network formation since it is a high aspect molecule nanofield. Okay, so we're almost done. Uh, here you can see what the 3D printed part looks like. After preparing the design, we 3D printed a nano composite peg that ear. Perhaps this might be useful for uh, ear regeneration or scaffolding or uh, for surgical applications. Uh, uh, certainly, we are interested in some of the more biomedical aspects of these 3D printed parts uh, in the future. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll be happy to uh, connect with you. Thank you for listening uh, to this uh, webinar. And um, Gerald uh, will be able to give instructions on how to get in touch with me or connect uh, with our work uh, after this talk. With that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, and again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are.